Hi, everybody. Um, today we have Jesse Oak Taylor with us for our first installment of the Language, Literature, Culture Dialogue Series. Jesse, will you introduce yourself to the viewers and listeners today? Sure. My name is Jesse Oak Taylor. Um, I teach in the English department, and my research fo focuses in the environmental humanities, um, especially around uh, the novel and how the novel functions as a, as a, in response to climate change. Uh, my first book was on the London fog and how, as a sort of human produced um, weather phenomenon and how novels can function as kind of cultural climate models. So we're going to talk about, about the novel um, and about how the novel models different forms of agency in relation to um, climate change in particular um, and also what it means to kind of read fiction that seems to forecast climatological disaster, um, the, the cyclone Amphan that is hitting um, Bangladesh and India right now um, is seemingly forecasted. Amitav Ghosh's novel, The Hungry Tide, that is set in the Sundarbans. Um, and so we're going to think about sort of the role of, of the novel and the role of fiction um, in imagining climate change and in imagining kind of political and communal responses to it. Recently, my, my work has been focused on the concept of the Anthropocene, um, this idea that we have entered a new geological era um, defined by human action um, as a force within the Earth system. So the sense that, that it's not just um, that, that humans are, in, are impacting individual environments, but have actually changed the way the planet functions um, as a single system. And a lot of people are quick to point out, you know, what does that even mean? You know, how, what does it mean to say that the human species as a whole does something, um, especially when all of the factors, climate change most notably, but deforestation, extinction, and any issue you want to point to, um, is driven by um, forces that are also dependent on social inequality. So that someone like me, um, with my high consumption lifestyle in the United States, um, is far more responsible for these forces um, than, say, somebody in, in Bangladesh who is currently facing this, this terrible cyclone driven in part by climate change. Something that I'm, I've noticed you've already pulled in is kind of thinking about the contemporary perception of like environment, humanness, et cetera, through this lens of a prior era, quote unquote, right, mm -hmm. set of texts. Do you have some examples that maybe folks that are listening or watching would be familiar with to concretize what you're getting at? Absolutely. So um, one of the things, so the, the class that I'm teaching right now um, is called Novel Ecologies Realism, Fiction, and the Planetary. So it's basically about the realist, whether the realist novel can account for climate change. Um, and our kind of key text is a book called The Great Derangement um, by, by Amitav Ghosh, um, who's a, a contemporary novelist. And, but this is, this is a critical work where he argues that, that the modern novel um, has been sort of culpable in rendering climate change unthinkable. That realism can't really deal with these vast inhuman forces. Um, and, so what we're doing in this class is kind of saying, okay, well, is he right? Um, and we started with Robinson Crusoe. Um, interestingly, the 17th century um, was almost defined by climatic instability. Um, so that all of these various revolutions and crises and catastrophes all over the world were kind of driven by the end of the Little Ice Age um, and, and is a kind of formative moment in understanding the role of climate in human history. Um, so that we're looking at the way that that actually does register in, in Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe let us think of this, about this kind of critical juncture in Anthropocene history. Um, a term that, that a lot of people call the plantation scene, right? In trying, going back to this problem of the idea that it's the human, the anthropos, um, man, um, as, as the, the driving force to say, no, it's actually um, colonialism, the, the specific form of the plantation as this kind of technology of biological d domination. Crusoe, in our, the story that we've been telling in this class, um, becomes this novel of the plantation scene. Um, then we shift to George Eliot's Mill on the Floss, which is um, written in 1860, um, but it's set in the 1830s, which is to say the critical juncture when industrialization shifted from water power to coal. 
um, the shift to fossil fuels, is the setting of this novel. It's set in a water mill in the 1830s in the English Midlands. Um, and so what, part of what we're doing is sort of using that novel to think about what it means to live through a major energy transition. Um, and also what it means to look back on that moment from 30 years later, because the other really notable thing about the Mel and the Floss is that it's written um, in the immediate wake of The Origin of Species. And Elliot read The Origin of Species a couple of weeks after it came out, um, actually wasn't that impressed by it because she was already thinking about so many of these issues. Uh, we then shift to Conrad's Lord Jim, published in 1900. Um, which takes place kind of at the margins of what we've been calling the, the Anthropocene frontier, um, the sort of the threshold of where, where global capitalism is extracting raw materials. When you say ext um, capitalism extracting these materials, what do you mean by that? Conrad is really dramatizing how integral those places are to the functioning of the modern economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that the equivalence today um, would be like the fact that um, the, the ongoing um, decimation of the Amazon, right? That um, the Amazon rainforest is being cut down at reg record pace right now, raising cattle um, for, for beef. So that's what I'm talking about, is that sense that sort of when we, li when we live in this modern interconnected world, um, the stuff that we encounter, um, you know, this, the desk that I'm sitting in front of, no doubt, is, is made of, you know, um, wood from some distant part of the world. Right. Um, so that that process of kind of extracting value um, from places that are extremely difficult to get to. You see a sort of eerie parallel, because in some ways it, it marked the advent of this sort of global capitalist circuit, right? Yes. Of like we can find the rarest item that we can sell for a higher price and is useful in this context where we can exploit this labor force that we have found from this other area in order to bring a product from X to A. Um, so that's, you're saying in your class, when you look at Lord Jim in 1900, that's where you see that really emerging and partly through that novel. Yes, absolutely. This cr crisis moment that we're now in um, and that it's really important to think of it as this kind of long unfolding process that these books kind of help us understand from the inside out, right? I think that, you know, one of the differences between reading the no reading novels um, and other ways of studying history um, is that it, the novel takes you inside this world, right? You kind of inhabit this other moment from, from the inside out. So we're ending with Amitav Ghosh's own novel, The Hungry Tide. This novel's from 2004. Um, and is set in the Sundarbans on the India-Bangladesh border. This area is also, um, a lot of it are tiger reserves. It's, it's one of the last holdouts of the, the Bengal tiger, um, and many of the tigers there are man-eaters. Um, and this is, is all, also true of, of the real world. Um, and so events in the novel end up um, covering conflicts between refugees who've taken, who've settled in the area, and forest guards um, who are there to protect the tigers and trying to drive people out. And furthermore, it's all, it's, it's, it's called the tide country in, in Gosha's um, just frankly luscious, beautiful prose. Um, but, but what he describes is the way that this, this land is always semi-flooded. Um, and furthermore, that makes it extremely vulnerable to climate change. Even you know, a, a meter of, of climate change would, would flood the whole area. Um, and so this is all kind of vividly dramatized in the novel. The novel then ends with a major cyclone um, that has been sort of forecast throughout. We've been talking about in this novel, probably we've been talking about all, all term, is the way that the novel um, works through a form of forecasting. It is deeply woven into how fiction works. You read a novel, you, you are reading to find out what happens that that if you if somebody tells you the end you they've spoiled it for you right you're practicing a form of forecasting um, and the key idea in that book is that novels can be climate models that they can sort of simulate the way that climate functions in um in, in entanglement or sort of um in conjunction with human history now this all has really come home to roost because there is a major cyclone hitting the Sundarbans right now. And he talks about In the Great Derangement, um, which was written after, this was a series of lectures that he gave at the University of Chicago. In The Great Derangement, he talks about another kind of uncanny synchrony, 
which was the Dahomey tide came out. Six months later was the major um, tsunami that hit and devastated, you know, Thailand and, and all sort of the, the, the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, and Ghosh was horrified. He had just written this novel that culminates with a major storm laying waste to this a very similar region um, and talks about in his own sort of almost guilt of, of sort of like, you know, how that it, it's hard not to feel culpable having sort of seemingly forecast this event, yeah. um, especially because the novel, it's not just, oh, it ends with a cyclone and then there's the tsunami. The novel is very much about these historical precedents and hints. And so that all of the foreshadowing throughout the book that this is coming, um, then it happens in real life. What I'm hearing is that in some ways the guilt isn't just like he conjured it into being, but it's like, what is the responsibility of like writers, artists, scholars who kind of study these forecasts that are happening and then to have those moments still materialize? The synchronization seems sort of improbable and uncanny and like, wow, that's so weird. But at the same time, it's not surprising at all. Right? Yeah. We know that climate change is happening. We know that it's going to it, create more kind of quote unquote super storms, right? We've had Sandy, we've had Maria, we've, we've seen Haiti level, right? We didn't know that it was actually gonna be the Sunderbunds, right? While we're reading this novel about extreme weather in the Sunderbunds. But on some level, how much difference does that make, right? When we know that, the, that these events are, are unfolding around us, that we are in the middle of this kind of calamitous yeah. epochal shift in earth history. So that part of what we've been talking about is this, this just um, sort of, th this, we keep using the word uncanny. Ghosh talks about uncanny in, in The Great Derangement. It does feel spooky. Um, but also a real question of like, well, what does it mean to be a spectator or a, or a witness it's on, on some level? How, do you, how can you be a witness and not a spectator yeah. um, to these events that you are sort of powerless to affect even though you feel partly culpable for them? Um, you know, that's the difference between watching a major storm and knowing that it's driven by climate change that you are, even if infinitesimally, nonetheless, yeah. you know, um, responsible for the better way to think about it rather than just the kind of, oh, my carbon footprint is so high because, you know, I fly in airplanes and whatever, um, is sort of, I'm a beneficiary of this huge global system that is destroying the biosphere and, and wreaking havoc on many, many, many people who are not beneficiaries of that system, right? They are already being, you know, the, the people who are most in the face of this, or we're already in a refugee camp, already in a refugee camp in the middle of a global pandemic. Now they're in a refugee camp in the middle of a global pandemic, and that re refugee camp is being devastated by a, by a cyclone. They've also reaped no benefit from it, right? I think that, you know, and that that's, that's, to me, is a better way than focusing only on the kind of responsibility question. Genuinely systemic response to climate change is that the issue has been so couched in terms of individual responsibility um, that it that it's, keeps coming back to kind of your individual carbon footprint um, rather than systemic change. There's so many parallels between climate change and the response to the pandemic. And one of the things that has been really clarifying for me is the fact that, you know, on one hand, widespread social change is possible. Um, and it seems to me that this is a good indication that it can happen, but it doesn't just happen spontaneously, right? Yeah. That somebody has to kind of make it happen. Part of what I'm hearing you say is that when you track these stories and these kind of immersive moments across history that are thinking about like capitalism and environment in some, and what I'm hearing is what gives you more hope perhaps is that when you shift the conversation away from this kind of hyper individualized responsibility approach where it's the hyper individualized one person has the power to change like all of these things to thinking more about coalition work and systemic change and how that's possible through a much more direct, um, we have to kind of see our interconnectedness. I as an individual um, am, am responsible is, is key. I mean, I, I really do think that it's key. I think it's notable that the, um, the language of the carbon footprint, which what can be helpful, right? It's a way of kind of visualizing um, aggregation. Part of, of breaking out of that is recognizing some people 
are more are differently responsible than others. Um, some people have benefited differently than others, but also some structures are have have made this condition inevitable. Some structures would have prevented it, right? And yeah. and I think one of the reasons that that um, I think the novel is interesting in this case is because the novel dominant theories of the novel have so emphasized it as a genre of the individual that the that the very idea of that that um, agency belongs to the human individual, <laughs> um, that that is kind of the locus around which everything orbits. That's an, a, a theory of the human that some people have linked directly to the modern novel as a form, right? Yeah. So that part of what we're doing, say, in my, in my class, part of what my work is about is trying to provide an alternative account to the novel. Think about stories um, that are about collectivity, that are about um, assemblages of humans and non-humans that don't collapse back to this story of individual agency. Because yeah. um, that, that story of individual agency is ultimately paralyzing. One of the problems with this book is the way that it, it sort of um, denigrates science fiction as not being quote unquote serious. Um, and I think Ghosh is really, he's, he's partly lamenting a problem with the way that sort of literary institutions have, have focused on realism as being serious and, and denigrating science fiction. Um, I think he's kind of trying to object to it, but he also participates in it. Um, and I, one of the reasons that that's a problem is that science fiction has been one of the places where climate has been most actively imagined. One of the things that novels do um, is they, they help us think about what is possible and what we take to be possible, right? On one hand, that, that it always, sure, it might be imagining an ultimate world, but that world has rules. There's conditions of possibility. Um, the way that, that COVID is encouraging us to, to think differently about community, to think differently about the relationship between individuals and community. Again, one of the oldest things that the novel is about is the relationship between the individual and the community. Um, but how some of these practices, wearing a mask when you go to the grocery store or whatever it is, um, have quickly become ingrained and quickly become normalized. And that one of the hopeful things about COVID actually is the way that it actually has become a new normal. Not that any of us wants it to <laughs> go on forever, um, but that, that it kind of exposes the fragility of the normal. Um, the fragility of what we had taken to be normal um, and that there are alternate ways of being and that we can kind of participate in this structure of feeling, this new structure of feeling. Um, and that in so doing, we might be laying some of the groundwork for what a kind of democratic response to the Anthropocene might be, what a, what a, a community capable, a sort of human community um, broadly construed capable of, of formulating a, a political response and an ethical response to this condition of, of climate change. Um, and I think that that is really important as, as something that sort of we collectively in the humanities are always trying to do in kind of imagining how alternate worlds function, how this world functions, um, but in particular kind of laying the groundwork for imagining alternate futures. Um, that, that really is what I think this sort of the study of history is all about. Mm -hmm.